Hi, I'm your host Vasco Duarte. Welcome to the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, where we share tips and tricks from Scrum Masters around the world. Every day, we bring you inspiring answers to important questions that all Scrum Masters face day after day. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a very special bonus episode of the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast. Uh, During the past week, we have had with us Jürgen Apelo. Welcome, Jürgen. Hey, Vasco. And uh, for today's bonus special, we have Ape or Aripekka Scarp, an old friend and ex-colleague. Hey, Ape, welcome to the show. Hello, Vasco and, and Jürgen. Nice to be here. Absolutely. So I'll, I'll introduce Jürgen as a serial founder, successful entrepreneur, author, and speaker. Jürgen is pioneering management to help creative organizations survive and thrive in the 21st century. I would say and add to that and beyond. And he also offers concrete games, tools, and practices so that you can introduce better management with fewer managers. He's also been a guest the whole week here on the podcast. So check out the episodes with Jürgen. The link will be included in the show notes for the past episodes with Jürgen. And Ari Pekka Scarp, also known as AP Scarp, is an organizational psychologist. He'll explain what that means in in practice, a psychotherapist and an agile coach. He has extensive experience working on large-scale organizational transformations, as well as with employee well-being in occupational healthcare. And his special areas of interest are complexity, the topic of today, compassion, and social interactions. And somehow I feel all of those three will come to the conversation today because we will be presenting three different perspectives on how complexity and what we've learned from the science of complexity can help scrum masters in practice. So let's first start by defining what we, all three of us, see as complexity, as it may be a new term for some of you, our listeners. So Jürgen, let's start with you. If a scrum master would come to you, let's say in a corridor of a conference after your keynote and would ask, what do you mean by complexity? What would you say? Well, first of all, I would say that my definition would change every year because by its nature, complexity is such a complex topic. You cannot boil it down to a one sentence uh, summary. As it happens, I am now reading a very interesting book, uh, Reality is Not What It Seems by uh, Carlo Rovelli about uh, quantum mechanics and uh, the title grabbed me and uh, it uh, it the, the the same phrase was used several times in in the book reality is not what it seems and i thought actually that's a really good summary of complexity science that what you think how things are is actually not how things are because <laughs> there's always something else going on when you dig a bit deeper when you take in a little bit more context and then your perspective keeps changing and yeah i love that but basically nothing is what it seems that that would be a good summary yeah and uh for for many of us scrum masters we have in practice been faced with that when we try to tackle a problem in some way and then the problem shows up in another way somewhere else and and you start to think, wait a minute, what am I missing, right? That's, that's one of the questions I think would come from the conclusion of that title, right? Right. And the problem is you're always missing something, but you cannot just uh, keep adding things to your perspective because you would have to include the entire universe to just talk about one <laughs> one problem because everything depends on everything else is, uh, is yet another summary of complexity science at some point you need to stop including things in your in your problem analysis and say okay well this is as far as my investigation and and my uh, navel staring goes now i need to come up with a response to what i have observed so far but whatever you've done it is always a limited perspective and there's always another way of interpreting the same things Absolutely. Now, th- this brings me to ask the question from Ari Pekka. Ape, I know that you've been writing about these topics related to complexity. You have studied it, especially in the context of, of work and, and businesses, of course. And I do acknowledge that you are one of those people that always helps me ask a different question than I thought I needed to ask. So I'm quite interested to see what comes out of this. So how would you describe complexity if a scrum master stopped you on the street and asked you? Well, I don't know what are the odds that that would happen, but uh, that's certainly... <laughs> Maybe after today's episode. <laughs> Let's see. 
Yeah, like you said, I've been thinking about this complexity for, for quite many years. And uh, my take on that is nowadays that uh, the complexity is, is all about mind. The source of complexity is the human mind. This is how I, I see it nowadays. And uh, I would say for Scrum Master that uh, the complexity really means that uh, when you have uh, interactions between people, for example, in the team or in whatever setting, those interactions will start to create patterns that will actually affect the future interactions. For example, if you have uh, this kind of uh, angry discussions with, with somebody, team member, manager, or whoever, that will probably affect so that uh, there will be some kind of a patterns forming from those angry discussions. And those could be, for example, patterns of fear, which would lead that uh, people are avoiding, avoiding these discussions. And uh, that will, of course, affect, for example, how this information is shared in the teams and in the company. So, so I would say that those uh, complexity is patterns of interaction between people that will affect the interactions themselves. One of the things that I take out of that description, and uh, of course, you're going to come in if you want to add something. One of the, the things that I take out of that description is the aspect that we very often discuss here on the podcast. We, we very often talk about psychological safety. And psychological safety is, is a useful label. It's even a useful shorthand in my mind, at least, if you have the perspective of complexity, meaning that psychological safety is not something that you build. It's actually something that emerges, right? It's either there or it's not there, but you can't build it. You have to create the circumstances that allow it to grow on its own. It's kind of an emerging property of a human system, right? And these angry discussions leading to future pattern of hiding information and so on, that just allows me to kind of break down psychological safety into some more detailed patterns that I can now start to observe, right? And, and if I'm able to observe those patterns and figure out what is triggering them, I may actually be able to do some things different so that those patterns stop happening so often. Would you say that's a reasonable way to look at this psychological safety from a complexity perspective? Hmm. I've never thought about it like that, but I was, my brain was uh, doing overtime while you were talking. And um, to, to, give you, to give you an example, I know from, for a fact that the Dutch are called the rudest people in Europe. I've lived in Brussels for 10 years. My partner has been a diplomat. <laughs> He knows uh, how to work with uh, people from other countries. And yes, we say what's on our mind, <laughs> basically. We call ourselves transparent and open, but others call us rude. And that's just the perspective, right? That's just the, the way you're wired. And that's maybe, you could say, by default, Dutch people feel more psychologically safe than other people in, in Europe. Because, yeah, we easily get into a fight with a colleague uh, over something insubstantial. And then afterwards, we have a beer. <laughs> and uh, that's pretty normal. <laughs> Uh, and some say, uh, including uh, my friend uh, J.B. Rainsberger, I'm sure you know him. So I, I wish everyone was Dutch, he said at some point to me. Everyone just shared what they were thinking without feeling that they would be punished for that. <laughs> it would make life so so much easier. So psychological safety is is there or or not, but it is a thing that you choose to to feel maybe subconsciously uh, because of the culture where you are from. And I'm from a culture where by default we feel more psychologically safe than than others. I just came from Bulgaria. Uh, I had a workshop in Sofia, and there they explained that by default they don't trust anything or anyone. They have a reason. Uh, historically, uh, culturally, not to trust government, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so there's a very different take. They have very different background, and I can assume, though I have not validated this, but it's a hypothesis. If you have a Dutch person on a team and a Bulgarian person on a team, that by default the the Dutch person will feel more psychologically safe than the Bulgarian person. But that was what's going on in my mind, and it's it's just a perspective thing of how you expect the environment to to treat you. It's 
it's the same team that both team members will be on. Even if the team does not know that one is Dutch and the other is Bulgarian, they will probably treat their comments more or less the same way, but one will feel safe and the other will, will not because of their history. Well, that, was, that went on in my mind <laughs> while you were talking, Vasco. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about this uh, compassion and empathy when I was listening to it. What you were saying, Jürgen, about this, uh, how safe people feel themselves. Because uh, I've met you several times and I don't think that you are rude, even though you are Dutch. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's about uh, how you can kind of relate to a person. So uh, even if you would be very straight and, uh, you know, transparent, like you said, if you understand what is happening in the minds of other people, which you are having the discussion, you can and you will make a little bit uh, slight changes to your uh, tone of the voice, uh, uh, how your facial expressions are, how your bodily move- movements are, are, and all these things are kind of affecting this uh, whole situation, how people perceive it. And of course, this culture is, is playing a part there also, but I think that this uh, ability to understand other people's mind and emotions and your own mind and emotions, which we call empathy, is key ingredient there. So how these patterns form are greatly affected by this fact that how how empathic people in these discussions are, how well they are tuned to each other's there. Very good point. And and if I may add, uh, there's a bit of a pet peeve. I think the Agile community has quite a bit to learn from other communities, such as uh, design thinking, service design, jobs to be done, etc., when it comes to empathy towards users and customers. Because uh, if I look at my involvement in the Agile community in the last 15 years or so, I feel that the interpretation of Agile is very often not much more than we need to optimize our productivity. Let's give customers what they want faster. (laughs) It's about velocity and throughput and the assumption that the customer knows what they uh, what they need and they they give us uh, user stories or or whatnot and then we try to get them through the process as fast as we can and then learn from their feedback that's not what they say in in those other communities the why they often say actually the customer and the user have absolutely no clue what they want <laughs> it's, a, it's a famous phrase of Steve, Steve Jobs as well it is it is our job to understand what the customer wants it's not their job and it's not always the case that we need to offer this as fast as uh, as as possible it could be part of the experience that they get something later than they would actually like I just finished the series uh, on on Netflix and I'm eagerly awaiting uh, the next season. Of course, it ended with a cliffhanger. This is part of the experience that I am not immediately served the first episode of the next season. No, I have to wait. (laughs) Psychologically, this adds to the experience of me liking the series because, and they call in gamification, they do this, uh, these things all the time. There's even a name, uh, a name for it. The uh, yeah, delayed gratification and uh, things like that. So it, it's about the experience, and we need to am- empathetic towards users and understand what kind of experience would they appreciate. And that is not always let's deliver stuff faster and let's, let's do what they ask. That is a, a gross simplification. Uh, I would even add that it's a self-defeating simplification because no business will be successful in the long term from just doing the same thing faster if there are other businesses in the same business area, right? Because somebody will come up with a with a different way of doing the same things, even slower, but providing a much better experience. I do take one question, though, from this conversation, a question that Scrum Masters can ask themselves when a conflict happens in a team or or maybe when there are missed expectations, disappointment in the interaction between team members. One thing we can ask is, how does my culture influence my reaction to this situation, right? And we can ask that same question from our team members, right? Like, okay, so you sounded disappointed when blah, blah, blah happened. How does your culture influence your reaction to what just happened? And that may be a way to kind of bring to our foremind, to to our consciousness, the impact 
of complexity in our work as Scrum Master, right? It's never just a person reacting. It, it's the person's whole experience through life reacting to something. So as uh, Jürgen alluded to, a Dutch might make a sarcastic comment that is intended both as encouragement and criticism, while a Portuguese might take that very personally and start holding a grudge towards Jürgen. Are you trying to share something between us? No, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I was trying to give a concrete example, though. <laughs> I am Portuguese, by the way, for those of you that don't know, obviously, that, that's why I made that comment. All right. So, but let's dive into the core of our episode and, and how complexity affects and influences our work as Scrum Masters and Agile Coach. We kind of designed this episode around three statements, and uh, I'll go first with the statement. And my statement is that in, in a world where we accept complexity, we can't predict the impact of our actions and therefore need to put in practice what I call a curiosity-driven way of acting at work. In other words, work through questions and be ready to be surprised. So that was my statement regarding how we can take complexity into everyday work life. Uh, and, and I would like to hear your comments. Let's start with Jürgen. I agree. It resonates with the idea that nothing is what it seems. So you need to assume that uh, what your perspective is could use some improvements. <laughs> and by for that, you need to ask questions and uh, basically have a feedback cycle going on between you and the environment so that the environment enlightens you and inspires you and uh, adds to your perspective so that you see things from another angle and, and things like that. Yeah, that makes makes perfect sense to me from a complexity thinking uh, uh, perspective, to use that word. Um, if you think about the complexity as a patterns of interaction between people, my statement would be that uh, in order to understand this complexity, you have to understand people's mind, what is happening uh, in people's mind, both in, in cognitive, cognitive uh, things like uh, information, understanding uh, the situation, but also in this uh, emotions kind of way, because uh, all of these things are affecting how we see our situation. And in order to have a clarity of mind, so, so that we can kind of see the situation in quite wide perspective, we need to have a safety, like, like you were saying, uh, trust, enough trust. There are studies that uh, if, if you don't have safety and trust, you don't actually see so wide perspectives, but, but your view is limited because of certain things that is happening also in this uh, emotion regulation. So I would say that this, uh, because the mind is interdependent, uh, we need to pay attention to these uh, interactions. You know, these daily inter interactions that we are having in our teams and organizations, what kind of dialogues we are having, with whom, what kind of patterns we see are, are coming from those dialogues and how we can skillfully participate those dialogues in a constructive way. So that this, uh, the compassion is here the key. So, so the compassion means that you have a constructive social action. You understand the situation and how you can participate in, in ways that will be uh, beneficial for yourself and others also. If I understand you correctly, Ape, what you're saying is, I called it a curiosity-driven way, but you, you use a different word. You use compassion. And as I understand it, that means accepting whatever is happening. And then holding that in the conversation, in the interaction with the other people and allowing them to express what is triggering their action without telling them, and, and I guess that means no judgment, without telling them whether the action was right or wrong. Is that what you mean by compassion? I don't mean that you don't, you can't have judgments or you can't have kind of opinions of, of what is good and what is not good, but uh, you have to have a wide perspective of how people see and feel the situation you have to accept that this is how this person sees and feels this situation you can have of course different opinions but uh, to be compassionate means that you you kind of um, you are not shutting down different viewpoints to the situation but you are kind of uh, uh, encouraging people to have uh, enough safety and enough trust to express their 
own viewpoints, you know, honestly in these situations. Again, turning this back into my work as a scrum master, this would should suggest something practical like to hold the conversation space so that everybody who wants to participate can describe how they see a certain situation. It could be a, you know, a conflict, it could be a, a missed expectation, could be a, a failed deadline, whatever that might be, but that we have the ability to allow everyone that wants to participate to actually share their view on why certain things happened without uh, allowing that to go straight into, no, that's the wrong view or that's the right view. Is that what you mean? Yeah. And a concrete example would be, we all have been working as uh, consultants in different uh, companies. And uh, if you have a discussions about what is happening in the organization, if there is enough safety and trust in these discussions, you will very quickly uh, have a very honest information of what is happening. But if there are lots of kind of, uh, let's say, fear in these uh, discussions, people are not honest. They don't bring up things so quickly. You have to build this kind of trust for days and weeks until you start to understand what is really happening there. So that would be a concrete example of it. Yeah, I, I would. I would say. I would like to say yes and. <laughs> Uh, to use the improv terms, it, it is better to have perspective, multiple perspectives, rely on multiple perspectives on a team rather than just your own. I mean, that's why we have certain practices such as daily scrums and, and shared uh, estimation of work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if everyone has the same bias on a team, then you still end up with the same bias towards a solution. You need to go further than that, rather than just uh, understanding the perspectives of the various people on the team. It is also good to know the perspective of an external consultant who does not have the same, the same bias as the people on the team. It would be good to have the perspective of someone from the other side of the planet. I mean, if you have seven Dutch people on a, in a room, they will not see something that a Japanese person might easily see. <laughs> when that person enters the conversation. You would need to wonder, what would an alien think of what we are doing here uh, to, to take it to the extreme? And that's what I mean, that's what I meant when we started. You can, you can do this endlessly, and ultimately you would have to include the perspective of the entire universe, which is, of course, undoable. But it is good to broaden your, your scope. Uh, in terms of of looking at uh, the things that you're trying to do, I re I believe it is uh, uh, Russell Ackoff, uh, the famous uh, systems thinker, who said uh, there's nothing uh, worse than uh, spending a lot of time finding the right solution to the wrong problem. Uh, it is better to find the wrong solution to the right problem. <laughs> so it's figuring out what is the right problem to solve. And, and lots of teams get stuck with trying to solve the wrong problem that is irrelevant uh, within a larger scope. And then they waste all their time discussing minor issues, irrelevant details. So, well, if they, if they took one or two steps back, if they include the perspectives of some others outside the organization, they would realize that they're just wasting their time on something irrelevant and there's something larger going on that they should be spending their time on. So, uh, well, summarizing, include perspectives, but don't stop at your team boundaries. You need others from beyond to every now and then say, well, this is what I am observing about what you're doing. I think that's a good, a good takeaway from a complexity. Yeah, and no, I, I agree with this. And I, I would say that this uh, kind of um, understanding of what is happening in the organization is, is just just the building block. It doesn't mean, it doesn't kind of include what we are doing. It just kind of gives us a perspective of what is happening. And this gives, uh, of course, lots of possibilities and options for what, we, what would we do now, uh, points for the reflection. But uh, it, it isn't an answer to this uh, question of what we should do. It's just kind of a description of what is happening now. So I would like to hear from you now, like you've done a lot of work on complexity and of course you have been a scrum master, you have helped scrum masters and you're now uh, among many things also an agile coach working within a, a large organization. 
So you apply complexity thinking in your work every day because that's how you see the world as well. That's what you've been writing for for a long time. So what's your statement on how complexity affects the work of Scrum Masters? Well, there are different levels of complexity. Of course, this uh, complexity of the work itself, uh, what, what kind of, uh, in what business people are, are working on. But uh, if I just uh, stay in this uh, perspective of people, because um, no matter what, what's the business, the people are doing it in, in all those areas. So I have seen that there are at least three different levels of uh, complexity that affect the work in, in concrete ways. One is this attentional complexity. So nowadays we have lots of different uh, things that are kind of uh, getting our attention. We have this Zoom meeting going on here, and then I have... Uh, my cell phones and whatever there that are kind of uh, distracting me from this uh, one task that I'm, I'm supposed to do. This is something that affects all of us, not just Scrum Masters and team members, but that's coming from the social complexity of things. Another thing is this uh, cognitive complexity, because the, the information isn't nowadays in, in some book that you can read and, uh, you know, manual that you can have <coughs> on your hands. It's distributed in social networks, and uh, those networks are continual uh, self-organizing all the time. So you have to kind of uh, keep up with the information that is changing all the time. And this is uh, challenging in, in our cognit cognition also. So you, you need to have this uh, very good uh, clarity of mind also. You know, because these uh, networks are also not just rational, but also emotional. You know, it affects how I, I feel with people that who I talk with. If I like you, I talk with you. If I don't like that person, I don't talk with them. So, so these networks are organizing also emotional. And then the third one that comes from this social complexity is, is this, um, you know, this complexity of, of the networks of people that we are having in the organizations also. You have m multiple teams there that you have to keep in touch and uh, have this, uh, if you have some, some common tasks that you have to do and uh, what kind of roles you have in the organization. And all this is kind of creative, creating this uh, quite, quite a mess, mess of things. Because of this social side of this complexity, my kind of... Uh, interest is in this compassion because it gives you also wisdom to act and i don't mean compassion just as a, as a thing that you would be very altruistic or you know think good about everybody or, or nothing like that but just to understand this uh, social situation what is happening and how people are attending to those situations and uh, how to reflect on what is wise actions here that includes enough different per perspectives, you know, and also selects the ones that are probably the best ones in our future actions that we are doing. But, uh, but it requires that you are tuned in all the those people who are attending these uh, dialogues and uh, common interdependent actions that we are doing. If you are not doing that, you are kind of shutting out lots of information of what is happening. So, so this is why I, I think this uh, people perspective and this uh, empathy and compassion are key elements in any leadership positions in this complex environment that we are now, now having, all of us. Absolutely. I mean, that, that would be a whole episode in itself. But Jürgen, your thoughts on Ape's perspective? I love that he says that it's about the wisdom, considering that the halftime of knowledge keeps shrinking. And the uh, the approach to just cramming knowledge in our heads, which is basically how I went through my educational years <laughs> in high school and university, that approach is not working anymore because we what we needed to know last year is not relevant anymore this year and so on. So instead of uh, absorbing all that knowledge and putting it in our heads, we need to be able to develop the talent of finding the knowledge in the moment that we need it. 
uh, and then apply it uh, in in a way that makes sense in that in that context. So that's a different way of using the human brain, and that's that's wisdom more than um, than uh, uh, knowledge that you're then uh, using. So I I I, I find that interesting. And it's a nice segue into my own bit of a pet peeve, uh, where I believe that that Scrum and Agile at large is still mostly trying to optimize the wrong thing, trying to optimize productivity and not innovation because a lot of it is about throughput and velocity, uh, as I said. And uh, for example, I read on the website of, of Large Scale Scrum, the advice that teams need to be long lived, uh, possibly uh, theoretically eternally together. <laughs> uh, don't do anything else. It has to be full time. Uh, don't be distracted by other stuff. And I think that's that's all of that is backwards because we do great things when we we combine ideas from many sources actually there's research confirming that nobel prize winners nearly always had other projects going on why because they use knowledge from various domains and then this does things in their heads and then they're able to solve problems that they would not have been able to solve if they had been focusing on just one thing i read exactly the same thing in the in the book that i'm reading uh, reading now uh, about um, about Albert Einstein, who who quit uh, school or university in in Germany, and went to work at a patent office because he didn't want the traditional German education, which was about cramming existing knowledge in his head. He was not interested in that. He said he read philosophy and and was a widely read person. And then he came up with after a while with what some call the most beautiful equation ever, which is that of general relativity. And he was not good at maths. <laughs> He, he needed help from friends to come up with this most beautiful equation that is ever devised in mathematics and physics, while this was not his main talent. But he, he allowed himself to be inspired by many things, and that is wisdom. He, uh, he could imagine things that others could not imagine because the mathematicians were only doing maths and they were not reading philosophy and and other things so the takeaway there is that uh, for me i don't like the idea of of people working full time on a project doing only that uh, trying to optimize delivery to a customer because then i think and and what are you going to be inspired by um, what is wrong with working on another team for a week uh, or a cup uh, a couple of days maybe some job rotation just be inspired by another project that's going on uh, expand your mind with different perspectives from different people that you work with every now and then because it is not about the productivity you're not trying to produce the same thing faster you try to come up with new things it, it, the experience of the of the user and the customer is not just about getting stuff faster it is about delivering things that they had not had before make something new that that did not exist uh, before and that requires imagination it requires uh, perspectives you didn't have before and you don't get those perspectives if you stay with the same team forever not doing anything else that is for me wisdom that is applying i believe uh, some some ideas from complexity thinking to teams and uh, yeah as i said there's a bit of my pet peeve as you may have noticed also in previous episodes of Ashko. yeah so i i would take that inspiration as you called it to signify and i don't know if i'm right here to signify the importance of having multiple perspectives and also to the need to have multiple perspectives to be able to think outside the confines of the problem as we saw it before is that what you meant jürgen yeah, um, I just had a conversation a week ago with someone on LinkedIn who who was against the idea of, of a generalizing specialist or T-skilled people because he said if you're T-skilled, you have uh, uh, you have knowledge and some knowledge and experience in other terrains. It means you're not optimizing for the one thing you should be best at. And I, I, I totally disagree, disagree with that with that concept because I think you cannot be really, really good and make a difference in one area if you do not allow yourself to be inspired by other things. That means you have to 
step back every now and then and do something completely different uh, as a mathematician make music <laughs> be on a band <laughs> or something as some nobel prize winners uh, did or uh, if you're a musician for example just work in another domain be on other projects uh, let yourself be inspired and and yeah, I think that's uh, very important if you try to survive as a company and if your teams want not only to be productive, but also innovative, which uh, I believe is a, a very important thing. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm reminded that uh, in the scientific revolution, the start of it, you know, with the Renaissance and then later on, the idea ha had always been that you needed to mix different perspectives in order to be able to move the science further right? it's it's only very recently and I, I would venture perhaps because of the educational system we currently have it's only very recently that the expectation that you need to be very good at one thing and need to know nothing about the other things has come to light i would say even less than a couple of generations even perhaps because uh, of course before that, most of the world was in an agricultural state. The Industrial Revolution only started at the, at the end of the 19th century, so uh, 120 years ago, 150 years ago or so. So this reminds me that one of the essences of complexity is that a problem is never defined how we state the problem, but it's defined by how we state it, plus all of the other interactions that we are not yet aware of, right? And And if we look at that, from a per perspective of the Scrum Master, that means that whatever your perspective is on a problem, whether it is lack of quality or a conflict be uh, in the team or a conflict with the PO or a conflict with stakeholders, there's your perspective, right? Like what you're seeing, there's what those other actors are seeing, there's the interaction between them, and then there's something else that you can't see yet, right? Because otherwise you would, you would have a different perspective. It, it kind of reminds me that we also need to be humble as Scrum Masters to find out that what we think is going on, uh, as, as Jürgen said early on, reality is not what it seems, right? What we think is going on isn't actually what is going on, and we, we need to be ready for that to happen, right? We need to, to be humble and perhaps I would say not arrogant to think that we already know what's going on. Exactly, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to Ari Pekka's view on this. But I, I, it made me, it made me think of because uh, you use the word problem, and I would say not every problem is a problem. Some problems are actually solutions that people are not aware of. Um, it, it makes me re think of the commute, for example. Lots of people have found out in in COVID times that working from home is uh, delightful because you don't have the commute. You just you just do your work from from home. Well, actually, it turns out that the commute had a very important uh, uh, role, which is uh, the context switching from one environment to another, which is what humans uh, seem to need. You work, you go from me mode, uh, personal mode to office mode. You you adopt a different identity, and because people miss suddenly the context switching, everything is is jumbled together while uh, at home. They feed the baby while being on the phone with with uh, with the colleagues and things like that this has led to an increased number of burnouts because the 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 boundary transition has disappeared that nobody realized that this was an important role of the commute so you have to reintroduce the boundary transition uh, the boundary ritual switching from from personal mode to office mode even if you're standing in the same place or sitting in the same chair yeah you, you, you need that as a human being so that problem of the commute was actually a solution uh, to something the one thing that i was thinking about this uh, this also this identity is that a uh, lot of what is going on is unconscious actually and when i work with my my customers for example in psychotherapy we do have a dialogues and discuss a lot of things, but in many cases, we, we start to do something else. For example, arts, painting some, something or, or composing a, a piece of uh, melody or whatever, because uh, that could be the thing that leads you to a different perspectives that you can't just uh, put in words, but you have to feel it in, in your whole body and have, have this kind of perspectives. And, uh, Carl Gustav Jung had a lot, a lot of influence on this, how to work with the unconscious. And one thing is this uh, art-based research. So, so this is something very interesting, how you kind of uh, think about uh, 
if you're researching for, for some, some product, for example, you could do that also in, in many different way, ways. For example, have this kind of artists making poems or, or songs or, or sculptures or what, whatever, and kind of find out some other perspectives to this kind of a problem that you are sol solving with your products. Uh, and this is something that we, we don't use very much nowadays, I think, in this uh, industrial. I'm a very big fan of using art as a way to explore technical and, and physical problems. And, you know, many, uh, even the military have done that through contracting writers, for example, sci-fi writers. But now Jürgen's statement on how complexity affects the work of Scrum Masters. Go ahead. Well, I think because of uh, what I learned is called network individualism, um, we, uh, which is the idea that we participate in many small communities that are different from each other. Like sometimes I'm part of the science fiction and fantasy writers community. Sometimes I'm part of the uh, agile community. Other times I'm part of the runners community. We dip in and out of these sub-communities all the time. Because of that, we also have to um, re-evaluate how we organize our work within a company and uh, allow ourselves to do uh, things such as dynamic reteaming and just in, in involve ourselves in multiple projects that are going on. Because there are there are benefits and not only drawbacks to um, to participate in various of these communities. I mean, in the sociological uh, research suggests that uh, um, in the past we worked on tribes, uh, where the, our friends were our family, they were also our neighbors, and they were also the people we worked with, and that number of people was more or less 150. That needs to be taken with a grain of salt, but that's more or less what we can handle as human beings in terms of cognitive load, of trust relationships and, and meaningful uh, conversations. But now all of that is distributed across many, many different sub-communities. And uh, apparently we can handle that. We can do a lot of contact switching as human beings. So my takeaway is uh, we need to do something similar uh, within an organization, allow ourselves to uh, go in and out of various sub-communities, uh, whether they are communities of practice or guilds or, or teams trying to do good work or different projects. Uh, that's a good thing, not just a bad thing. And some people have seen this only as a problem when team members are, are uh, taken from teams and put on other teams and then they come back a while later and then, oh my God, velocity is destroyed. Yeah, well, uh, too bad. But actually, that person gained some really interesting insights from the from that other team that could be very useful for your innovative ca capabilities uh, uh, on the way from here. That's uh, that's my take. Yeah, I was thinking that what complexity means for scrum masters is one thing is that uh, it requires skills of dialogue. So, for example, studying the art of coaching or, or, or whatever ever other kind of uh, arts where you use language and, and kind of uh, build up uh, constructive dialogues with people. This is one thing. Uh, another thing that I was thinking is this understanding of group dynamics, which is very, very important also in order to understand what is happening, not just on the individual levels, uh, individuals' mind, but this interdependent minds of us, which are groups, and, and, and those groups are not just kind of the fixed teams, like you can say the, the groups are forming in different situations. And all of those groups have group dynamics, even if it's not the kind of a fixed team or something like that. So dialogue and group dynamics, two things to kind of study further. And I'm I'm reminded that actually that's one of the advantages we get from participating in multiple sub-communities, as, as Jürgen was just relating, right? Because you gain different language, and the moment you gain a different language, you are able to reason about you know the 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 day to day work in a different way because uh, the limits of our language are the limits of our world, as Wittgenstein used to say. Uh, so th that's one aspect. Then the other thing that comes to mind from Jürgen's statement is that these different perspectives coming with a different language as well. These different perspectives 
allows us to find more productive ways forward. Like well, in, in, in part of my work, uh, when I work with teams, we talk about no estimates. And one of the things that we very often end up talking about is what can we deliver that has the same value, but takes a 10th of the time, 10% of the time to deliver, right? And, and very often teams are puzzled. What do you mean, right? We can only deliver when we've finished all of our, all of our stories. And that, that's why I try to put them a different set of constraints. And I say, what, what if you had only one day? What could you deliver in one day that would have the same value, right? And I'm, I'm reminded that I'm able to do this because of these multiple different communities I'm part of, right? Like uh, jobs to be done sub-community, as an example, is one way to look at, at, at a particular functional problem of a service or product we're trying to develop and to think about it from different ways and think about, okay, so what's the real core value for the person who is to benefit from this interaction, right? Like, uh, is, it, is it that we just want to add a feature, which is very often the case in many of our teams, or is it that we want to provide an experience, as Jürgen was alluding to, or, or we want to remove an obstacle, whatever that is, right? Like, we can start to think about it that way, and that I can only do because I have been participating in these multiple communities. So I'm thinking that from your statement, Jürgen, I would say that as a Scrum Master, I need to understand that if I don't look outside my immediate community, in this case, work-related, so like Scrum as an example, then I'm missing a set of different perspectives. And to, to your point that you made early, it's not an infinite number of perspectives. Like we can find perspectives that are relevant to our work, even though they are not 100% related to our work, right? So it provides us a way to navigate these multiple different communities of different perspectives that helps us to reason through the topics that we have to deal every day. And I would say, for example, as a Scrum Master, something to do with psychology for sure, something to do with emotional intelligence or the ability to, to reason through emotions, not only to, to tackle problems as if they were engineering problems, et cetera, et cetera, would be useful communities for us to seek out and to learn from and then come back and be a Scrum Master every day. Yeah, for sure. I think the Agile community is extremely biased towards software development. There's a reason for that, of course. But if we want to truly uh, make uh, uh, make big advancements, we need to look beyond and learn from how do they make TV shows? How does the fire department work? What happens at hospitals? And then you'll we'll, you'll find that there's many different ways of organizing yourselves that are completely different from how Scrum works, uh, for example, why why Scrum would not even make sense. Um, uh, uh, They make TV shows per season and they don't make TV shows per minute. That that that's 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 absurd. <laughs> the cost would be would be extreme if 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 it happened like that. So um, we need to be inspired by others, but other perspectives out there. But there is the law of diminishing returns, of course. I mean, you learn a lot from a couple of those foreign alien perspectives, but uh, don't go overboard. You don't need to learn everything about the entire universe to solve a few problems on your team. Uh, but just do more than just be inspired by uh, by what happens on your own team there's so much more out there absolutely well we're getting close to the end guys first of all thank you very much for being here but uh, if people want to contact you and learn more about the work that you're doing where can they go ari pekka let's start with you i think the best place is this uh, fractal sauna blog that i i have written a few years for finnish people i have a uh, Two books that I've written, one one with uh, George Mead's philosophy, it's it's called Geho Mead, Mielia Mina, and another one about the human mind, and uh, uh, it's a uh, Mielen laboratory, a laboratory of mind. Quite excited to at some point have those books in English as well, Ari Pekka. Yeah, yes, that's true. So we'll put the links on the show notes, of course, so that people can go in and check out Ape's work. He's done some amazing work on the topics that he brought to us today as well. And Jürgen, where can we find out more about you? Well, my uh, obviously my personal website, jurgenoplo.com, is, is the main one to find my contact details and things that I've done in the past. Uh, the new work that I am involved in is unfix.work. We talked about that 
on previous episodes of our show. And um, yeah, I look forward to continuing the conversation around how can we be more innovative and deliver better experiences to our users rather than just uh, giving them faster what they ask for, (laughs) which uh, they may think is beneficial to them. But actually, uh, as Russell Akov said, that might be the the, the wrong problem that you're solving. (laughs) I think there are better problems to solve. Absolutely. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for your generosity with your time and your knowledge. Thank you, Vashka, for the invite. Thanks, Ari and Pekka. Yes, thank you. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring. 